porta-voz das Forças Armadas Bolivianas afirmou hoje que o guerrilheiro morto no domingo passado era realmente das Forças Armadas Bolivianas afirmou hoje que o guerrilheiro morto no domingo passado era realmente Ernesto Guevara. After the hero dies, that the legend is born. The legend of Ernesto Guevara, better known by the name Che, is no exception to the rule. Like all legends, it is based on reality, a reality that has gradually slipped into an imaginary universe in which the hero is no longer a living being, but a myth. A life in the public eye and an early death were enough to make Che a legendary icon of all revolutions. Il a eu une enfance, effectivement, une enfance bourgeoise, mais pauvre. He had a bourgeois yet poor childhood. His parents were very much what we'd call today bourgeois bohemians, ahead of their time. His father was somewhat of an eccentric and an anarchist, and his mother was brought up by nuns. So the family was really very bourgeois, yet they didn't have a great deal of money. They left to set up home in the Sierra de Cordoba, an arid area in the middle of Argentina on account of their eldest son's asthma. His name was Ernesto. He wasn't yet Ernesto Che Guevara. He was a very puny, skinny child, and he never went out. His mother used witchcraft to try and save him, as medicine was not enough. She would search for black cats and lots of other things that she'd put in his bed. And then, at the age of about five or six, they'd say, he's done for, we might as well let him go. His sister told me that they let him go like a bird from his cage. And instead of falling from his cage, he managed to fly. He took advantage of life, he did sports, rode horses, and started to shoot and swim. He was so tenacious and had such strength that he dominated his asthma. You have to understand the place asthma occupied in his life. He was living on extra time because the asthma almost killed him when he was very small, and all his life he suffered terribly from that. So by dominating his asthma, he became someone with extraordinary tenacity. While he was in secondary education, he moved in high society circles, even though, again, he didn't have much money. But his parents were so well known that he always had lots of invitations everywhere. And then, when he'd finished his secondary studies, he returned to Buenos Aires, where he plunged himself into studying medicine. Before he'd even finished medicine school, he decided, along with an older friend who was older than him, Granado, to take a major trip around Latin America. They could very well have gone to see the pyramids, gone to Paris, or done something other than discovering their own continent. What's interesting in their case is that they remained in their homeland, Latin America, the Pachamama, the motherland of the Incas. There were two high points of this trip, which proved to be rites of passage for Che. Machu Picchu, because it was there that he was exposed to pre-Columbian civilization, and as a Spanish descendant, he thought a great deal about those past civilizations that had been destroyed. He was angry with the Spaniards for destroying those civilizations, and after Chuquicamata, he was angry with the Americans for enslaving his Latin American contemporaries.
They were shocked to discover the terrible endemic poverty in a mine called Chuquicamata in northern Chile, a place where people were born and died, who were almost at the mercy of their American masters in terms of slavery. So there were the beginnings of shock and a reflection. Having suffered a fall which didn't do too much harm to the motorbike, our team headed for San Martin de los Andes. When we had nearly arrived, I was leading, and we had another accident on a gravel-covered bend, bordered by a gently murmuring stream. This time, the bodywork of La Poderosa was badly damaged, and we had to stop there. To make matters worse, that's when one of the accidents we were dreading most happened, a rear tire puncture. Dès qu'il revient à Buenos Aires, il termine ses études. As soon as he got back to Buenos Aires, he finished studying medicine, passed his exams, and within a few weeks left again for a second trip. This trip resulted in him leaving Argentina. He had gotten to know a young, politically committed Peruvian woman. She was rather plain-looking, but very militant. And she developed Che's sense of Marxism, which became very strong. At one point, he even intended to go to Mao's China, and very nearly went. But he stayed in Guatemala, where he witnessed American imperialism on a very real scale. In Guatemala, in 1954, a left-wing, nationalist member of the army set up an agrarian reform, which was fought by United Food, a major American banana-producing company. This agrarian reform led to the toppling of Colonel R. Benz, which benefited the United States landing. Ernesto Guevara was there at the time and witnessed the landing of the mercenaries supported by the United States. He tried to organize the resistance with the Guatemalan Communist Party, but the balance of power was much too in favor of the Americans. He learned very important lessons about preparing an effective revolution, about preparing for a United States military intervention. He learned about the need for training a popular militia. He remained in hiding for a month at the Argentine embassy in Guatemala, then organized his departure from Mexico, where he took refuge. He again met with the Cuban exiles he had met in Guatemala, who had traveled from Guatemala to Mexico. These Cuban exiles first introduced him to Raul Castro, then a month later to Fidel Castro, who had been granted amnesty and had just arrived in Mexico. In Mexico, he immediately tried to organize a team of commandos to return to Cuba to bring the revolution there. The Cubans started referring to Guevara as El Che, as for them, all Argentines started their sentences with the word Che. For Che, his first meeting with Fidel was utterly and wonderfully decisive for him. He felt that Fidel possessed all the qualities of a real war leader and the necessary determination, tenacity, and intellectual potential to successfully carry out such an improbable adventure. It's staggering to think that 82 men went in conquest of an island that was protected by over 50,000 men heavily armed with the help of the United States. Their adventure started one evening in November 1956 when 80 of them crowded into a small second-hand boat. Fidel Castro was so impatient to arrive that he moored at the wrong place, where he was not expected. It was more of a shipwreck than a mooring. 
Guevara est légèrement blessé. Guevara was slightly hurt, and at one point he had the choice between taking a bag of medicine and a box of arms. He couldn't take both, so he chose the arms. From then on, he declared that instead of being a doctor, he would become the revolutionary militant and the guerrilla he'd always been. Batista's air fleet was waiting for them. They were bombed, and there were many deaths, but they managed to escape with the help of people who were waiting for them. A dozen or more members of this expedition reached the Sierra Maestra, which is a small mountain with such thick vegetation, it was very difficult to spot them. It was in the Sierra Maestra that the revolution and the struggle were organized around Fidel Castro and Ernesto Che Guevara. Che became an emblematic figure of the revolution that Fidel Castro used to his advantage. It was also in the Sierra Maestra that the legend of Che was carved out. A popular figure of the revolution in progress, he became the most famous of commandantes. Che's asthma and his penchant for sacrifice, which was linked to his asthma, his Jansenism and his asceticism, generated by a very severe regime, made him a remarkable fighter. He proved to be the best, the wildest, the most daring. He was almost unaware of danger. Fidel made Che the first commander of the Cuban Revolution. He placed him ahead of his own brother Raul, which was an extraordinary mark of respect. Che was so courageous and fearless, it was almost too much. Fidel would tell him they needed him so badly that he was not to go and get himself shot, that he should hang back a little. Calm down, he'd tell him. He trained his men to act in ways that were heroic and crazy. Having said that, there weren't many fighters in the Sierra Maestra. But when Che's columns and Camilo Cienfuegos' columns started up, they began to attract a certain number of poor peasants who joined them. As time went on, and the rebel army started winning military combats against Batista's army, it also carried out, in parallel, a very efficient and interesting policy in the mountains. The policy was led by Che Guevara and consisted of setting up schools in the Sierra Mestra mountains, and hospitals too. In reality they were tents, but the peasants were treated there and taught to read and write wherever possible. The rebel army paid great attention to their relations with them. That's how, little by little, the guerrillas proved efficient against the dictatorship. It's also how they won social support. Hoy aprovecho la oportunidad de la visita de un periodista cubano para dar al pueblo de Cuba el primer saludo que tengo oportunidad de in parallel, these successes fed the development of popular mobilizations in the towns. Che Guevara left at the head of the guerrilla columns to take a central town on the island of Santa Clara. It was a real feat, because he had never been there before. The very first time he went on to Santa Clara, he applied a military tactic that enabled him to capture the island. From then on, Everything fell apart for Batista's army. In December 58, the dictator fled and the revolution was victorious. Yeah.
This is Rebel Radio from Cuba, an American free territory. Victorious, the revolutionaries, the liberators from the Batista dictatorship, rode into La Havana on tanks, cheered on by an ecstatic crowd. From then on, Ernesto Che Guevara occupied an increasingly important position in Cuban political life, becoming Minister of the Economy, then Minister of Industry. Che arrived in Havana bearing the reputation of a great commander. Fidel Castro had always been wary of anyone who might have too much prestige, a prestige that could outshine him. So he asked Guevara to look after the fortress of La Cabana, which overlooked the port of Havana, and where previously first revolutionaries had been imprisoned, and then following the victory of the revolutionaries, Batista's henchmen. C'est Guevara. Fidel Castro in charge Che Guevara with the task of organizing trials for the prisoners of Batista's regime. It wasn't just another episode in Che's history. It was probably the most indelible task he could have had. Cubans who were on the receiving end at the time and family members of those who were shot called him El Canicerito de la Cabana, the little butcher of La Cabana. Under his orders, dozens of prisoners were executed following ridiculous trials lasting anything from a couple of minutes to an hour or two. People were shot in the night. He wasn't at all bothered if he was sent people who hadn't been tried in court. He was in charge of carrying out executions on those who had been sentenced. At first, they were people who had been involved with the Batista regime or involved with repression, but soon it was counter-revolutionaries. That resistance fighters are violent, in my point of view, is legitimate. From the French point of view, it is also legitimate, because they are always singing the praises of Jean Moulin and the other resistance. So violence by resistance fighters is one thing, but when you're in power, shooting 300 people is a crime. The La Cabana episode was to reveal Che's darkest side. Although he was driven by strong values of social justice, he did not hesitate to have hundreds of sentenced opponents shot following mock trials. The execution of the former head of Batista's police was an example. Some authors claim that Fidel Castro was already a communist. But I don't think he was. Guevara, on the other hand, had a real knowledge of Marxism, but without having been a member of any communist party. There is not communism or Marxism in our ideas. Our political philosophy is representative democracy and social justice in a well-planned economy. Fidel Castro, in your Fidel Castro still didn't know whether he'd become communist or Marxist. He became Marxist, particularly on contact with Che during the Sierra Maestra, and he asked for the support of the Cuban Communist Party, because the Cuban Communist Party was organized on a vertical discipline system, which was not the case with even Fidel Castro's troops. From 59, in the face of attacks Washington was preparing, the revolutionary leaders, in particular Castro and Guevara, were looking for support. 
Che's experience in Guatemala was very important here. They were looking for support in the face of what they quickly understood was going to be a swift and inevitable break with the American government. And they were to find this support in Moscow. It was only after a year of diplomatic, economic and political guerrilla tactics with major U.S. companies that the veil was lifted and Castro declared himself a friend of the Soviet Union and a partisan of a system of collectivist socialism that the Americans very quickly branded communist. Fidel Castro has just thrown a huge spanner in the works of United States-Cuban relations. In the speech he gave, despite his illness, to the first Latin American Youth Congress, he announced the expropriation and nationalization of American companies in Cuba. This decision will affect businesses such as the Cuban Electrical Company, Esso Standard and Texaco, which are worth $1 billion. This marks a new episode in Cuban-American tensions. The United States decided to finish with this dangerous individual, and it organized badly a landing in Cuba, persuaded that the population would rally around the counter-revolutionaries that were landing. Fidel Castro and Guevara were on all fronts, which led to the famous fiasco known as the Bay of Pigs. The U.S. realized it wasn't quite that easy to get rid of Fidel Castro. And Fidel Castro, from then on, deliberately turned towards the Soviet Union to ask for their support. The way in which the economy was treated in Cuba was, it was like the sorcerer's apprentices. Che got Lenin's watchword into his head to industrialize the country. For him, sugarcane signified a sort of slavery and also a fatality for a single crop producing country. Cuba needed to get industrialized, except there were no raw materials. And just as Chavez is currently destroying the Venezuelan petrol industry, Che set about destroying Cuba's sugar industry. They were around 30 years old when they came to power. Now that's okay to be in power at that age if you're talking about just one person. But when they're all that age, you need older people to balance things out in government. So things weren't always that easy. He became an economist overnight, although he was more of a poet more of a Don Quixote than the owner of a bank. It wasn't easy for him, but he gave it his all. This unbridled revolution that so exasperates the Americans confuses the Soviets. They who claim to be experts in matters of revolution are discovering a new country with a Cuban fantasy, in the face of their fever and their way of putting the cart before the horse. In less than two years, Cuba has become more socialist than Russia. After agrarian reform, urban reform and nationalizations, the Cubans have now decided to make 1961 the year of education. One of the first results of his reforms was that the Cuban peso, which was previously worth exactly one dollar, lost all its value. He recognized his own mistakes and the gaps in his economic training, but all of a sudden, he himself started to theorize. He signed the banknotes Che, which was part of the poetry and the romanticism of his history, but it was done very seriously. Che didn't joke around. There was major debate over the principles that had been adopted in the Soviet Union and those that he was developing. The debate was one of material stimulus versus moral stimulus. 
The material stimulus principle that had been adopted in the Soviet Union and that the most realist of the Cuban communists thought they could adapt was to give either more money or consumer goods to the people so they'd work harder. Che disagreed, arguing the people should simply be given moral stimulus. That's what moral stimulus meant. They'd be given a little pennant or medals to show they were avant-garde workers and that they were leading the first free territory of Latin America. Of course, it didn't work. He had the idea that a revolutionary society could create a new man. People were asked to work non-stop. They were asked to work on Saturdays and to do voluntary work on Sundays. They were asked to be impeccable from a moral and spiritual point of view. They were asked to be incorruptible. He demanded that Cubans do this voluntary work. Many of them didn't enjoy going to their voluntary jobs because they already had their usual jobs, and it meant that in their moments of rest, on Sundays or in the evenings, they had to go and work for the country as well. So it was not always well perceived. But Che, as usual, set the example and engaged in the necessary physical effort. He didn't work for himself at all, but worked for others. He believed in what he was doing because it was a utopia. He made the famous marvelous statement, let's be realistic, demand the impossible, and that was his dream. But he saw it wouldn't work during the invasion when he arrived in a village and said, I forbid you to drink and play the national lottery. It created such a rumpus. People said, who does he think he is? Tell him to get lost. So he saw it wasn't working. That's why Che's new man was the death of him. Among Guevara's writings, and they are prolific, is an article he wrote while he was in Algeria. He was asked to write a piece for a revolutionary magazine, a left-wing Uruguayan magazine called Marcha. The long article he sent them became a revolutionary work and was used as a sort of Bible by many revolutionaries throughout the world. The article was called Man and Socialism in Cuba. To understand to what extremes a revolutionary can go, you just have to analyze this text, which is full of exaggerated lyricism and unconditional sacrifice. The asthmatic leader was prepared to sacrifice everything, and he demanded that others do the same. The Cuban leaders luckily didn't have a great deal of responsibility during the missile crisis. The Cuban leaders, with Fidel Castro at their head, wanted to send, as a preventative measure, a nuclear missile onto a major American town. That's what he wrote black and white to Nikita Khrushchev. It was an error on the part of the Soviets because it was the Soviets who set up the missiles. But when they saw where it could lead, they said, we're going to withdraw the missiles. But Che totally subscribed to the plan to fire a nuclear weapon onto a major American town and to provoke a worldwide holocaust. It was clearly in line with his beliefs, but it was above all in the line of Fidel Castro's beliefs. He was merely following his mentor. Shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Fidel and Guevara, Castro and Guevara, but especially Castro, were extremely upset to see that discussions between Khrushchev and Kennedy took place without him. As a result, relations became more stilted with the Soviet Union. From that moment on, the Cuban economy started to take a downturn and had to count on economic aid 
from the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc countries. So Fidel was obliged to compromise, whereas Guevara, who in the beginning was so impressed by the Soviet Union with a sort of undying admiration, became disillusioned. A clear but gradual difference developed between Fidel and Che, until Che, who was the spokesman of Cuba, launched into a diatribe against the Soviet Union, or almost against Soviet imperialism. That was the day Che Guevara went too far. One could hear him backstage booing the Soviet delegates. He said something a socialist country or a country on the road to socialism had never dared to say. That socialist countries had a duty to pay, in arms and resources, third world countries seeking freedom. They shouldn't sell arms, as was the case for the Soviet Union and the Eastern countries. Once back in Cuba, Che's trust turned to suspicion. When he finally met with Fidel Castro and Osvaldo Dorticos, the Cuban president, he kept his head lowered. Behind the smiling facades, the tension was palpable. Castro tried to make contact with him, with the son he disappointed, but Che looked away under the weight of the mute accusation. From that moment on, Guevara disappeared totally. It was Guevara's last public appearance, and from that point on, Guevara understood that he no longer belonged in Cuba. He was a revolutionary. He wanted to carry the revolution throughout the world. It was his mission, in a way, his urgency, his life. So he was sent to the Congo, into a fairly neutral zone, not straight to South America, but to a zone where he wouldn't bother the Russians. Which is why he went to the Congo on a totally grotesque mission, as no one there was prepared for guerrilla warfare. It was a bit like in Dino Bruzzati's book, The Desert of the Tartars. They arrived, set up a guerrilla school camp, but didn't find a real enemy. He arrived there wanting to render the Congolese revolt rational, but according to his perception of rationality. He never actually bothered to understand that there was a reason behind all African mystical sacrificial acts. So you can see his great will, his very dangerous side, because he thought he was right. He thought he could behave however he wanted. There were a few skirmishes and finally the Belgian Rangers, helped by the Americans, who had informed them, cornered them. They realized that the only solution was to escape, that this guerrilla war had not served any purpose. People started wondering, but where's Che? What's happened to him? To get rid of the problem, Fidel was to do Guevara a disservice. Deliberately or not is still a matter of debate. In October 1965, he gave a public reading of a farewell letter that Che had left him. Vamos a leer una car, aquí de puño y letra, aquí transcripta. Amaki, del compañero 
Ernesto Guevara, otras tierras del mundo reclaman el concurso de mis modestos esfuerzos. Yo puedo hacer lo que te está negado por tu responsabilidad al frente de Cuba y llegó la hora de separarnos. Sépase que lo hago con una mezcla de alegría y dolor. Aquí dejo lo más puro de mis esperanzas de constructor y lo más querido entre mis seres queridos. Cette lettre disait des choses un peu bizarres. The letter was rather strange in parts. It stated that Che formally resigned his positions, posts and ranks and his Cuban citizenship. It praised Fidel very directly. It was a bit like the victim praising his executioner. He was a consenting victim. When you analyze the letter in greater detail, you realize that the terms used in it are often similar to those used by the victims in the Moscow trial. The public reading of this letter condemned Che to eternal exile. But for Fidel, people could make mistakes. Yet if they continued to be devotees, he would forgive them. And that's what happened. He forgave Che and allowed him to return to Cuba and organize his expedition to Bolivia, where he died as a martyr. It was the finest gift he could have given him. With Fidel's support, he formed a team of commandos of 16 people, 17 including himself, from executives of the Cuban Communist Party, previous ministers, deputy ministers, etc. They were to form a school of guerrillas who in turn would carry word of the revolution to Peru, Brazil, Argentina and Chile. He ended up in Nyankawaso. I've been there myself. It's a deserted place. There's no one there, just a handful of scared peasants. He thought the peasants would follow him in Bolivia too, but not one single peasant joined the guerrillas, not one. Bolivia was another country that had undergone agrarian reform, which was the basis of Che's political program. The peasants supported the government in a way. The country had experienced coup d'etats. In fact, it was the Latin American country with the highest rate of them. What was irrational, in a country as politicized as Bolivia, where the unions were so strong, was to believe that because their little group of guerrillas was hiding in a forest, things would spread the way they did in Cuba. But Che had the Cuban experience firmly in mind. He had arrived in a country he didn't know, nor did he ever know about all the previous political work that had been done by Castro in Cuba. Once Mario Mange, who was secretary of the Bolivian Communist Party, had received orders from Moscow by letter, the party didn't want that guerrilla warfare, and it was doomed to fail. Developing this revolution in Latin America, if it succeeded, would have been very good for Cuba. But it was also a way to get rid of Che. He was becoming, or could become, troublesome. And if he died, that would create an exploitable hero. The CIA knew he had been in the Congo and quickly understood he was in Bolivia which they became certain of when Debray was caught with the Argentine painter Ciro Bustos. It was only when the presence of the small expedition was picked up by the Bolivian army and by CIA agents that Che's guerrillas were forced to move 
la guérilla a été obligée de faire, que la guérilla du Tchad a été obligée. And they started to circulate in the region, a region they didn't know, where there was practically nobody to convince, since it was the desert. It was an extremely hostile region. And between December 1966 and October 1967, they were like guerrillas without an enemy. They didn't try and enter into contact with enemies. And when they did look for them, they didn't find any, until the day they got denounced by peasants. Their destiny was sealed, it was over. I think things were over the moment Moscow told Monje to let Che get bogged down in the matter, to leave things alone, not to get any more guerrillas, not to seek out the guerrillas from the other side. Then things were played out on the ground, it was over. I've been there, it's bare, there's nowhere to hide. It wasn't easy. They were extraordinary all the same, hiding in the ravines. They held out as long as they could. How did Che let himself get caught alive? It said that his gun was broken. He most probably gave himself up. In my view, that doesn't make him a coward, but a human being. He was no longer a hero. He no longer wanted to be a martyr. He wanted to live. And he was convinced he was going to survive, because photos of him that had been taken immediately after his capture were circulated, in which Che was clearly alive. Also, Régis Debray and Ciro Bustos, the Argentine painter, were both on trial at Camiri in Bolivia, for which there was international media coverage. There was also government intervention on a worldwide level, including by General de Gaulle of France. When he was captured, Che thought he'd get away, he thought he'd get out alive. I think Che wanted a trial, in which he would have developed all his theories and his profession of faith. But the Bolivians didn't see things that way. You have to differentiate between the CIA and the Bolivians. The CIA didn't want to kill Che. They knew that if they killed him, he'd become a martyr. The Bolivian military couldn't care less about that. The Bolivians had had a prisoner like Guevara in their jails, they would have had a very significant political problem. Uh, if you remember what happened with Regis Debray, the international press made fools of the Bolivians. Là, ils ont pris la Then they decided to kill Che. When the order was given to eliminate him, then they had to decide who would pull the trigger. They decided to give a present, a funny present, but that's how it was put to him, to a young sergeant, Tehran, on his birthday. They told him he could have Che. The guy went in but couldn't bring himself to pull the trigger, so he went off and had a few drinks, then came back and shot him. But it didn't work. So there was a guy from the CIA there, and he supplied the final shot. He was executed in the mountain village of Higuera and transported by helicopter to Valle Grande, where he was laid out on a bench in a laundry. Che was dead. Che's body was put on public display like a trophy. People came to see the corpse of the infamous revolutionary. These images were to tour the world. From then on, Che's face has continually been used as a symbol of revolutionary struggle, raising his character to the rank of a veritable master of Marxist-Leninist ideas. Pare un momento el son, que se callen las guitarras en tributo de silencio por Che Guevara.
For us, Che's death was a huge event. Without boasting, we were the only ones to hold a huge meeting in the Mutuality Hall and 2,000 people came to honor Che. So it was really important for us. And he died in Bolivia. There was the internationalism of it all. We still remember Che's attitude explaining that to help Vietnam, one, two, three, four Vietnams had to be created. He had a new way of talking that the old communist Stalinist bigwigs didn't have. So that was another reason our generation took to him, especially as, at the time, we had started to oppose the leaders of the Communist Party. We were being kicked out, and we were against Stalinism. We thought they were too nationalist, not internationalist enough. So for us, Che was the real model. It was really the idea of de-alienation, that we weren't going to lead a sad, one-dimensional life. Che represented that. Did he represent it wrongly? Was he a straightforward Marxist or a Leninist? And did we get our icon wrong? Well, yes and no. From what I know about Che's character, I think he was rather inflexible. But that's his personal life. On the other hand, it's true that regarding anarchic social realism, regarding sexual liberation, which for us was very important, regarding feminism, regarding the attack on family, regarding anti-psychiatry, in relation to those trends, it's not wrong to identify Che with that wave of desire for freedom. It's a myth that he himself tried to create from the beginning. He saw himself as a hero of the liberation of Latin America. But above all, it was Fidel Castro who very quickly understood what he could do with Che, a dead Che. He was no longer interested in a living Che. He wanted to get rid of him, but dead, now that would be extraordinary. I think if Che hadn't existed, Castro would have invented him. Che was far more useful to Castro dead than alive. The huge portrait of Che that now overlooks Revolution Square seems to invite Cubans to make ever more effort and sacrifices. Although dead, he lives on. At the entrance to the tiniest village, you can see his effigy in naive colors. His face can be seen from on high on a huge panel among the fields. In 89, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Soviets told Cuba it had to grow up and become economically independent. The face of Che, which had been buried, even his books could no longer be consulted in Cuban libraries, was revived. All of a sudden, the Guevara myth was revived. The stoic character who was against any monetary interest and for whom everything had to be based on a moral revolution on stoicisms, suddenly became necessary and even very useful. Within 40 years, Che had died, had been unearthed, then was buried again. Because 40 years later, Fidel considered him sufficiently dead to be able to transport him to Havana, where they made an enormous mausoleum. Che has this fixed, impeccably organized image. School children all over Cuba start their day reciting Seremos como el Che, 
We will be like Che. We can transform Che into an icon, a hero of the revolution. Three peso notes are printed, recalling the era in which Che was president of the Central Bank of Cuba, etc. We sell t-shirts, key rings. There's a whole worldwide market, even a Che lottery. The image of Che by Corda has toured the planet and is as famous as the image of Marilyn Monroe. You can't talk about the myth of Che in the past. He's still alive, he's everywhere. Not just on demonstrators' t-shirts, but also on people who dance salsa, whereas Che never danced salsa in his life. He's become the symbol of Cuba, even though he wasn't Cuban. He's been cast in the wrong role. That icon fits the one-dimensional period we live in. The only thing that matters is image, and there's nobody behind that image. Out of the hordes of young people who wear the t-shirt, because when I see them wearing them, I ask them, it's very rare to come across someone who knows who Che Guevara was. If I ask them why they're wearing it, they reply, it's the revolution. If I ask them what revolution is, they answer, stirring up shit. It's not very thought out. In 68, people lived with portraits of Mao, Lenin, Marx, Trotsky and Stalin. Their reference was the 1917 Russian Revolution. Today, if you look at young demonstrators in Paris, Berlin or Rome, one portrait still remains, Che. And for the good reason that he embodies so well the idea of revolution, internationalism and a refusal of bureaucracy, which for me are really good values, very fair. These values are so good, in fact, that as usual, capitalists try to trade on them. And you can now see Che all over the place, but I hope that'll backfire on them. The legendary portrait taken by Cuban photographer Albert Corda, representing Che in a Christ-like way, has toured the planet. Andy Warhol made it even greater, using the same style as for Marilyn Monroe, Two icons among so many others who died young. A veritable icon of the revolutionary idealist, Che has become the symbol of struggles all over the world. His determined involvement and the consistency of his ideas has made Che the only figure that today embodies the ideas of Marx. Because even if Ernesto Guevara did commit violent, not necessarily legitimate acts, his romantic guerrilla image has banished them from our collective conscience. Puede que tu carne humana no resistiera el acero, pero el acero tampoco puede resistir tu ejemplo. Pare un momento el son, que enmudezca la palabra para escuchar el latido del Che Guevara. Que siga el son. Para la historia y el 